Today we're talking about theory integration and the ways occupational therapists put together theoretical perspectives to consider the best clinical reasoning for assessment and intervention with their clients. So how do we combine especially models but also frames of reference in practice? Many occupational therapists might say that they use an eclectic approach, which they really might. Or they might say, I'm not really using theory at all, in which case they're not telling you the truth because every occupational therapist is coming from some sort of theoretical perspective that is guiding their clinical reasoning as they make clinical decisions in regard to their client. Are they doing exercises with their client? They're coming from a biomechanical perspective. Are they doing a cognitive task? Well, they're coming from some sort of cognitive rehabilitative approach. Are they uh, providing adaptive equipment and education in its use? That's a rehabilitative perspective. Are they considering the client's occupation and what is central to that person that gives them meaning? Then they're coming from some sort of occupation-based perspective that they've absorbed over time. However, there isn't any established structure for helping occupational therapists think about how they're using theory in practice. So Moses Ikeugu approached this uh, by saying we should use this strategic eclecticism, which comes from psychology. And what this begins with is, a, is an occupational therapist choosing a theoretical practice model that makes sense to them in light of what's going on with their particular client. And this is going to be um, the organizing model of practice. This is going to be what the occupational therapist uses to center their thoughts on. So for me, the model of human occupation has always made sense to me. So as I'm working with a client, I may or may not be using a MOHO assessment, but I'm thinking through, what's their volition? What's their personal causation, their values and their interests? What are their habits and their roles? So their habituation. And how about that mind, brain, body system? What's working for them and what's not working for them? That helps me consider the person, then I consider the environment, and I consider the occupation that they're doing, and I try to move them toward adaptation. So I always have that perspective in the back of my mind, helping structure my thinking as I'm working with a particular client. So this organizing model of practice helps us guide our overall assessment but then a time may come when we're thinking, well, we need an additional perspective to help bring in a different perspective. And for IQ, he said this is a complementary model of practice or a CMP. So let's say I'm trying to explain to this client that I'm using model of human occupation with exactly what it is I'm doing and why I'm doing it. I might grab a piece of paper and draw three circle, circles and use the PEO perspective to talk about how I'm trying to get their areas of function to overlap and to fit to increase their occupational performance. So that may be um, a way to kind of start incorporating their own, um, their own initiative, their own volition, their own internal drive um, to, to help them get motivated in therapy. So as I'm being very cognizant and aware of these combinations and shifts in thinking that I'm making, I can be more systematic in my approach as I'm integrating theory and practice. And the more systematic and intentional that I can be, the better my results and outcomes are going to be. And I'm going to be more effective in using theory to guide my practice. Now, what happens when I start to bring in frames of reference then? So I'm starting with an occupation-based model, and this always helps me prioritize the occupational needs of my client. So this may be something that's a little less obvious to the other uh, you know, professions that are operating around me, to the speech therapist and the physical therapist and the social worker. They may not see me thinking in occupational ways, but it's always in my mind helping me structure how I'm thinking occupationally about my client. The frames of reference are going to be a little more obvious. So I've worked with a lot of stroke clients in my time. And of course, back in the beginning of my career, we focused more on the motor control way of thinking about things and moved into more of the motor learning as the research came out 
um, demonstrating how a task-oriented approach was, was better at helping get people back to their occupations. So those frames of reference then directed my focus for assessment, how I would set my goals, because that was language that all the other professions could understand. And then it would look at that specific domain that the client had a need in and help me address that in that way. So frames of reference, practice guidelines in specific domain, where our OBMs are um, can be visual models that help us look at the principles and the relationships between those principles and, and have a visual sense of where we're going using some sort of a visual model. The frames of reference give us those practice guidelines in specific domains. And when we bring in that frame of reference that might help us focus on the specific kind of impairment that the person has, we're going to be able to look at what their problems are in the context of occupation so that we can focus on all the needs of the client. That's what sets us apart as occupational therapists, that we think occupationally for them. So what do we want to do? We select that OBM, which helps us um, focus on um, that client's particular occupational needs. It can be more eclectic. It can be um, based on the OT practice framework, which is a very eclectic approach in itself. Once you have learned about theory and you start to look back at the OTPF, you can see tons and tons of theoretical approaches interwoven. In particular, the intervention approaches come from EHP. If you look at the supports and barriers, uh, you can see a lot of PEOP. Uh, there are just a lot of examples of um, theory woven within the OT practice framework. For our purposes in class, we have you select one, and also moving forward in process classes, you're gonna select one. Uh, so we're not gonna make you be eclectic and think of all of them, but just kind of select one that's gonna help guide your thinking. It helps you conceptualize and have language for discussing how you're gonna approach this person from an occupation-based perspective. And it gives you guidelines for how you're going to assess them and how you're going to intervene. Maybe not exactly what you're going to do, but how you're going to go about it. So for example, being client-centered, everything you do is going to be client-centered and you're gonna operate within those guidelines no matter what the specific intervention is, whether it's in a cognitive realm or a mental health realm, or a, um, a biomechanical realm, you can still be client-centered in all those different areas by bringing in your occupation-based models. So you're gonna select one or more frames of reference. In fact, it usually is more than one. These are usually more explicit, like you're using a biomechanical frame to do exercises. It can be a more well-defined approach, such as in hand therapy, there are specific protocols that you have to go through. But these specific practice guidelines to help tell us how do we assess and what do we provide an intervention within these specific domains. Now I have a few slides that I received from Michael Iwama um, that basically he, uh, as part of talking about Kawa model, he talks about what is theory in the first place. So I'm just gonna include these because I thought they were really helpful because they're taking us back to where we were in that first week of class, thinking about what is theory for? Why do we have theory? It's just simply a way of thinking about something. And so he gives the example of this sentence, the most important thing in life is blank. Well, without that sentence, you might not actually think about what is important in life, um, but it helps structure our thinking. It helps give us a prompt. And that's all that theory is, is a prompt to help us think about different aspects. So, as we're thinking about theory and occupational therapy, so we have this definition of these interrelated constructs and what they're for, but theory and occupational therapy from a rational or linear perspective in the Western world often sort of takes us through these diagrams. So this would be our occupational adaptation. This would even be like MOHO. It takes us through sort of a um, maybe a more mechanized way of thinking about things. That's one of the reasons why when you get to Kawa model, you see why Michael Iwama was trying to conceptualize things from a little bit different theoretical perspectives. And for example, the, it, these linear constructs help us think about, okay, what's true? What's something we've observed happen? Well, we understand by observation that people's occupation is important to them and helps motivate them more. So this is the same thing as saying, we see dark clouds, we see lightning, we're pretty sure it's gonna rain.
and using theory tells us what we need to do about that, we might want to take an umbrella along with us. So models are metaphorical. So for example, you could use a hamburger to talk about the PEO or even the CMOP. Uh, there, you know, there are many different visual images that you could use. The river is a metaphor for the Kawa model as well. They're going to ring truer for you, as some of them will, will be truer for you than others, and that's because models are cultural. Um, they can be very personal as well. And I've um, said before in theory class that if you come out of theory with at least one strong perspective to help you think about staying occupation-based in practice, I will be really happy with that. Thanks, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the lesson. I'll see you in lab.